Hi, welcome to Talking Brains, a podcast about mental health, books, and what makes brains happy. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie Sarkis. First pandemic and quarantine, especially when you have ADHD and anxiety. Ari's site is adultadhdbook.com. That's A-D-U-L-T-A-D-H-D-B-O-O-K.com. Well, welcome back to the podcast, Ari. It is always great to be here. I think you, you've been upgraded to frequent guests now. Sweet. Does that mean I get like flight upgrades and stuff like that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's how nobody's convincing? flying. Oh, yeah. Nobody's... All that's... So you get what, all the what upgrades. What flights would that be? You get free flights. <laughs> you get all the travel you want. Right. But it's Excellent. only good until the end of the month. Oh. <laughs> I'm surprised there isn't a business that's giving away free flights and stuff just to be like, hey, here's all this free stuff. And they'd be like, oh, too bad you can't use it. That'd be yeah. a good marketing scheme. Well, my neighbor was, was saying that we should buy our tickets for August summer vacation now. You know, because it's probably going to be cheap. So, um, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Huh. Your neighbor's smart. I know. So, so that speaks <laughs> to that speaks to I think what we're talking about the pandemic and and being quarantined and everything is that that kind of speaks to we're we're kind of being creative and also using some of our dark sense of humor. Too. Right. So, so, tell me a little bit about what you see in your practice as far as when people have ADHD and because anxiety we know is comorbid, what, 50% of the time, the ADHD, what have you noticed from people that you've been talking with and just generally about how people are, are coping with the uh, self quarantine? I know a lot of people have stay at home orders. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell me how people are, are tend to cope with that right now. You know, it's, it's an interesting time to say the least, right? So I think it, it's really sort of, it's a bit all over the map in the sense that, you know, it depends what your circumstances are. So if you've got a house in a big yard and access to a park, it's one kind of experience. If you live in a small apartment in the middle of Manhattan, man, that's a whole different experience. Um, or do you have the ability to work from home, which is good on the paycheck, maybe bad on the stress? On the other hand, if you're one of those many people who've been laid off, then, you know, you got plenty of time, but that's not good on the stress. So um, because you're worrying about other things. So it's really kind of it's a bit of a mixed situation um, that it does present new opportunities, which is good. But it also definitely adds new stresses and challenges, which uh, we'll talk about here. So tell me, speaking of stresses, what's one of the main concerns that you feel that people are facing right now with self-quarantine, particularly when they have ADHD or anxiety? I mean, I think the big thing for most everybody is it's the uncertainty of it. You know, it's not like, I don't know, if you get a snow day, let's say, even if it's like, you know, crazy snow, you know, like, okay, is it going to be two days or three days? Not sure, but, you know, something like that, we're all going to be back to normal this is much more wide open. So, you know, we were told initially to do a two week. Is that, you know, was that going to be the number? Probably not. You know, at this point, we know that isn't the number because we've passed that depending on where you live. Um, You know, so how soon are we out of this once we are out in what capacity? It's definitely not going to be just flip all the, all the breakers back to on and, you know, we just go back to normal life again. So there's going to be some gradual rollout of this, but it's all still up in the air. And the reason is it's evolving and the situation is responding based on, on what we as individuals and as a society does. So it's kind of like unknowable. It's not just that it's unknown, it's that it's unknowable. So being able to sit with the uncertainty, being able to tolerate it, being able to have faith that I will come to know the answer, I just won't know it yet. Definitely easy to say, but you know, certainly also harder to do. And does it all also affect when people with ADHD have issues with transition anyway? Do you think that that impacts how they're dealing with self-quarantine? Yeah, I think absolutely. That, you know, it, for for the good or the bad, you know, normal life, as in pre-quarantine life, at least it had a structure to it and it had a predictability. Now, you might not have loved it, but at least you knew it, right? Um, nowadays, things are so much more wide open. 
And, you know, that makes those transitions that much harder because often the transition points are a lot fuzzier, you know, as opposed to some kind of hard stop things like it's 703, we better get out the door for the school bus. Like that's pretty clear, you know, as opposed to now, it's so much more just kind of amorphous for a lot of us um, in terms of what our lives look like. And how important is it for people right now to have a set routine? Um, I mean, I think generally speaking, people tend to do better with something of a routine. Now, there are those people at the one end of the spectrum who are like all about routines and they'll schedule to the minute if they could. And then there are those who feel like routines are prison and they just want to kind of roll and let it go where it goes. So you know, the advice I give on this is, on the one hand, take advantage of some of the flexibility. So I think probably most of us are, are sleeping a little later than we used to, you know, because if nothing else, you don't have to commute anywhere. Um, so if that's the case, roll with it, enjoy it, be a bit more flexible about things. On the other hand, and this is maybe more true for our friends with ADHD, um, you know, if things too open means just like wide open, just like wandering through the day kind of thing, then maybe at least putting some structure in place would probably be a good idea. That's what I thought too, that that having some free time is good, but with ADHD, if you have too much free time, you're kind of like a, a blowing through the wind kind of, just a leaf right. kind of tossing around. So <laughs> I think there's a there's a fine line there. And, and also, what would you say to parents that are now having to kind of act as a uh, impromptu teacher and yeah. they have ADHD, maybe their kids have ADHD. What's the, what's one of the ways that, or more than one way that they can cope with that change in role or, or that stress level? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a double whammy, especially if you're working from home that you're managing your work, which might be easy or it might be its own difficult, annoying transition. Um, and then you also have to moderate your kids and their education. So, um, and not even necessarily the work itself, so much as like the doing of the work. Time to log on. No, okay, seriously, you need to focus on this. No, do not go over to Fortnite. That's not what we're doing right now. Okay, why are you texting your friends? You know, like it, it's like homework time times, you know, five or 10. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, it does add to your workload as a parent to then have to, you know, make sure that your kids are on track. And, you know, if they're 15, it's one thing where presumably they're a little bit more self-directed. But if you've got little ones, you know, elementary school, I mean, you know, you can't just tell an eight year old like, OK, get online at, at 930. I'm going to be on the computer in a meeting, you know, so. Um, so it does kind of increase the workload and the just getting used to it all that we're all trying to do here. So it sounds like part of this is just adapting to our new normal. Yeah. And we don't know how long that normal is going to last, that new one. So yeah. I, I, somebody had a quote that I thought was really good. It's not that we're working from home. We're working during a crisis and we have to be working from home. Right. And I thought that was a really good point that this is a crisis and we need to kind of acknowledge that things are not going to go exactly the way we planned because nobody's done this before. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, certainly in terms of like kids in school, we've seen this where, you know, I've talked to I mean, I know this from our end. I've talked to other parents. I've talked to students. I've even, you know, had some I have some teachers who are clients and talked to them. And, you know, it's sort of like there's been this rolling out of, or evolution of the plan. Like, this is what we're doing two days later. Okay, no, actually, that, that's not what we're doing. Okay, now here's what we're doing. That, oh, actually, no, it, as it turns out, that's not the thing that we're doing. So anytime you think you know what's gonna happen, like, who knows if that's actually what happens? So, you know, because the, the teachers and the schools are trying to figure out how to do this from a technology perspective, from a logistical perspective. Um, some classes transition very easily to online. Others really don't. And, you know, so it's this kind of like moving target and none of us know when it's going to move again. And what would you say to parents with ADHD or just people with ADHD in general that they've had to work so much harder than other people to find a job that fits them 
And now they find themselves in the situation where the job, they finally snag that job that fits their sleep schedule, fits their life. Yeah. And now that's been put on hold. What, what's some advice that you could give to people who are in that position? Um, you know, I think the first thing I'd say is this is not forever. It might at this moment feel like forever. It might feel like you can't remember a time where this wasn't what your life looked like, but this will not be forever. And even on some of the longer, more dire forecasts, it's still not forever. So, you know, just keep the faith, hold in there. Um, and, and this is totally not like you could totally go just pie in the sky, rosy. This is all wonderful. Like, and that's not what I mean at all on this, but but, you know, there are the parts of this that we can't control, but then there are some things that we can do something about and opportunities to be taken advantage of. Um, and I'm not saying that makes up for the terrible cost that's being paid, but sometimes, you, you know, like you take advantage of what you can. So, you know, you and I were talking before we hit record, like this is great time for pets, you know, like they're getting way more attention and affection um, than they normally would when we all disappear all day. So, um, again, I'm not saying that makes up for the fact that people who've lost their jobs and everything else, but you know, like there are some things that you can benefit from time with, with your, you know, with your family who lives with you. Um, you know, I did a zoom call on Sunday with some friends from high school. I did another zoom call Sunday night with some friends from college. We never talked to each other cause we're all too busy. So like that was a thing that never, ever would have happened if not for this bad situation. I think there's really something to say that because we because we meet as colleagues, the four of yeah. us that uh, that we've met, what, twice now um, that we are spending more time instead of just texting each other. We're actually talking to each other. Yeah. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to the fact that the slowing down of things, I think for some people, with ADHD, that's been great. But I think for other people, it's kind of driving them a little nuts, too. Yeah. Uh, that if you like to have action all the time, this is probably not the ideal. Um, and so I noticed people are trying starting to drift towards maybe, uh, I would say, risky behavior. And what would you say to people that are maybe drinking more or uh, doing things that are a little more daredevil? What would you say to them about how to cope when things feel just kind of like, as one of my patients said yesterday, it's boring with a capital B. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like if you are one of those kind of thrill seeker or just kind of a little bit restless, that being cooped up at home can be a real challenge. So, you know, I'll give the obvious, the easy to say advice of try to channel some of that productively. So to try to do some sort of exercise and, you know, if you can get out of the house in a safe way, then do so. Um, and to just not expect yourself to be able to sit there all day. It's just not, it's a setup for trouble. Um, and, you know, there's lots of folks like even like I work out with a, like a semi-private trainer and I just got, you know, I've been getting emails from them that they're switching to sort of all sorts of online stuff, even, you know, though normally you go to the gym and use their stuff. So like there are ways to sort of adapt here. Um, I think for stuff like drinking, it's easy to slide into trouble on that, where you don't necessarily set out to drink too much, but just little by little, you wind up drinking more and more. And like, I totally get that because um, you have the time and you're not driving anywhere anyway. So, um, but I think it's, it's to know your slippery slopes, like to be able to identify where are the places that I'm going to tend to go to excess, you know, how do I know it's too much? Um, what can I do instead? And don't just white knuckle it, but what can I actually do instead? And I'll just put a plug for, for us and for other mental health clinicians. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us have transitioned all online, so we're still available. Yeah. It's just, we're doing it through video or phone. So, so there are yeah. people you can reach out to, uh, because I know that, that for a lot of people, especially in recovery, this has been kind of a, a really uh, challenging time for them because there is so much more time on their hands. And yeah. there's, there's maybe not that accountability piece that you had before, because maybe now you're in your apartment, like in the city by yourself. Um, and it's really tempting to just call like Uber Eats or have somebody deliver something to you. Yeah. Um, so we really need to be careful about that. And and I think that's important you bring up exercise because that's been found at least, prime. Uh, I guess, what's the word? Not primarily, but 
provisionally that has been found to be one of the protective factors against COVID is exercise at least an hour a day. Huh. So, uh, and they're finding that people that do contract COVID, the ones that have a greater, I mean, uh, comorbid conditions aside, because if you have immunocompromised system and all that stuff, that's a whole nother ballgame. But the people that that don't have immunocompromised or already existing lung disease, when they exercise an hour a day, they're recovering and not having as much breathing issues from COVID as other people. Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. And also sleep too has been found to be a protective factor. And I mean, that all makes sense. You know, like, I mean, it's just that basics, like sleep, diet, exercise, and let's throw in stress management, you know, healthy stress management. Um, Like those are just generally protective factors in lots of ways. Um, But I think especially at times like this, it's that much more important to really get that, you know, to, to do those things that take care of yourself. And what would you say to people that are on stimulant medicine and they're kind of maybe not taking it as much or like I've worked with people who have decided they're not going to take it on the weekend and you and I know what the studies say, but if you could kind of let everybody know what, what do the studies say about staying on your medication as prescribed? You know, it's, I mean, on the one hand, the thing with the stimulants is you can skip days. Like that's a thing you can do. Unlike stuff like the, you know, antidepressants, or if you're on bipolar meds or whatever, like you don't want to be skipping days, that's a problem. So like you can skip days, but the question here is, is it a good idea? And, you know, maybe it's okay, but I don't know, maybe it isn't. And in some ways, actually, the fact that things are so loose and unstructured now might actually make it more important to be on your meds. Because otherwise, like we're talking before, you just wander your day away. Mm Mm-hmm. So again, the accountability piece. Yeah. So, but I don't know. What are your thoughts? I feel like you're driving somewhere with this. <laughs> you know me well. Um, <laughs> I I think that ADHD is an all-encompassing disorder, as we've seen in research. So um, I, I say to people, unless you're experiencing a side effect, keep doing things the way you've been doing them. Uh, if you don't take your medicine on the weekend, usually, then maybe continue to do that. Always check with your doctor. Uh, but if you're experiencing something, call your doctor. I mean, I know they're really busy right now, but also if you're having some issues with your medicine, just contact them. Um, and it might be that you might need a different medicine or a different dosage, but keep doing the thing that you're doing because now again, since we're at home, we don't, if you're not at work, you don't have that set structure or the accountability of a coworker going, Hey, do you have this project, you know, piece done for me? So I think it's even more important that we adhere to medication routine. But I can also see if, if you usually don't take it on weekends and maybe that's just kind of how you roll too. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the general thing also just of like in this unstructured different time, sometimes to carry those routines with us is a good idea. You know, it just sort of helps kind of ground us and at least feel like there are some things that have stayed the same. There are some things that we can control, Mm -hmm. you know, unless there's an issue where, I don't know, you're running out of medication and then you may want to conserve it. Like, okay, that that's a a bit of a different situation. Yeah. Um, That's a good point too. Cause sometimes medications just aren't available right now too. So. Right. Right. Or you can't get a refill yet or, you know, other issues like, so there's there's pragmatic matters, but And how about couples that are now finding that they're working together from home and maybe that wasn't the case, you know, two weeks ago, what yeah. would you recommend for them? Especially like if one is ADHD and one doesn't, cause that was a majority of research for your book yeah. where couples where one does, one doesn't have it. So what, what are some things that they should kind of look out for? What are some possible outcomes? How do they cope with that? I think, you know, the biggest first thing I would recommend is talk about it. You know, that this is not a normal weekend. This is not just a regular, like, I don't know, that week between Christmas and New Year's when a lot of people are home and not much is happening. Like, this is a whole different situation. So talk about what you each need. Like, what's going to be the best way for each of you to get through this? How do you work well together? I've had lots of conversations with folks about, like, you know, where they're trying to figure out who goes where, like what room are people in or what times or whatever. Um, And to sort of have some of those conversations about stuff like that. Um, And to just recognize that you may have different needs, but as, and this is kind of, again, easy to say, but to try to take advantage of some of this time that, you know, for a lot of couples, the complaint is we don't see each other enough you know, because everyone's running in too many directions. 
now here's a chance to actually see each other. And I mean, be careful yes, what you what you ask for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, we still need time apart. I think that's still important. But you know, I think sometimes having a bit more like making a point of using some of that time to spend together. And, you know, some of that means kind of fooling around sexy time. And some of it's just like whatever time or like playing a board game as a family or going for a walk or, you know, like whatever. Um, But to try to get some benefit in the relationship to this time that we didn't necessarily ask for, but here it is. Right. So I guess the moral of it is is try to make the best of, of, uh, of an unexpected situation. Yeah. And what would you say for couples that, that, you know, the beginning it was like, oh boy, we have all this time together. This is great. And now that we're what, like one, two, three, four weeks in that honeymoon's wearing off, would you say that that's pretty usual for the couples you're working with? Absolutely. So I think just knowing like, okay, this is like, this is typical. This is normal. It's going to happen. Fine. Um, So, you know, I think it may be a time to kind of reassess your expectations or maybe to talk through again, like, okay, so, so what are we doing now that this has kind of been a while, we're sort of at it. Now, what are we doing? And maybe to sort of shuffle some things around or to just have some honest conversations about like, I feel kind of stir crazy or I miss our friends. I wish we could hang out with them. Nothing personal against you like that. I see all the time. (laughs) you know, but I also miss our friends and, and those are both true things, you know? Right. So, um, you know, sort of think about, I don't know, how to sort of mix it up a bit so that it's still good to be there. So just to expect that there's going to be some speed bumps, but if yeah. somebody, somebody staying the obvious helps. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, you know, I think that what can happen with times like this, where we spend a lot of time together is it can sort of ex- it can magnify both the good and the bad. You know, so the parts of the relationship that are working well can be even better, or we feel even happier when we're together. But couples who are struggling already, this can then kind of magnify that struggle and unhappiness. Which we're kind of seeing in China now, there's been an increase in divorces and also an increase in pregnancies too. Yep. So, yep. so we're seeing two different things happen, you know, as a result of being quarantined. So it sounds like, uh, like, like any other crisis, it emphasizes the stuff that's working well and also can emphasize the stuff that's not working well. Yeah. And can be a catalyst to move in either direction. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like if you feel like these circumstances are pushing things more to the negative or are amplifying the negatives, you know, this may be a time then to say, okay, seriously, we or I, like, we need to do something about this. You know, like, this is, it's much harder to ignore this and just kind of chug along. So how do we, like, what are we doing here? You know, how do we make this a better place for us to be? Can't change where we are. So how do we make it worth sticking around? That's a good point. So what if a couple decides that they're like, you know, we just need some time apart and now you're in quarantine. What options do they have? And you know what? I've had at least one client in that situation where, you know, it's sort of like, do we spend some time apart? But if we do, then like, are we going to be able to come back together? Maybe the answer is not really, you know, so where there are other logistical things. If you go stay somewhere else, you then wind up having a quarantine again and blah, blah, blah. So or can you afford living in different places right now? Right, right. Or could you even get another place? Mm-hmm. You know, because like how many landlords are doing showings at right, this point? Right, You know? Right. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that it becomes more a thing of like, okay, let's try to find some ways to get some time apart. So maybe I'll stay in these rooms, you stay in those. Or, you know, at night, I'll watch TV here, you go do that stuff there. Or, you know, let's try to get out of the house, at least, you know, one of us so that we get some time apart. Um, Because I think there is something to be said for time apart also. You know, like, that's generally a good thing. I mean, it's all a matter of degree and how much each of you needs, but, um, but yeah, I mean, getting some time apart and being able to enjoy it. So then when you come back together, it's a better thing again. So it seems like with quarantine too, and just in general, even if you are getting along, 
it's good to have that built in alone time, even if your relationship is pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that old absence makes a heart grow fonder Mm -hmm. idea. And I guess we all have different levels of how much apart time we need and how much together time we need. Yeah. Yeah. And to switch tracks, what would you say to people that have anxiety and have a somatic component, meaning that they tend to uh, express their stress or anxiety in physical ways, like stomach aches, headaches, or chest pain, or even panic attacks? What, What are some kind of words of guidance you could give to people right now that they, and also with allergy season, people are waking up with scratchy throats and, and assuming that yeah. they're getting really sick. So what's, what's something that we could say to them to help them with their stress level right now? I mean, I think some of it is just to sort of recognize that all that old normal stuff is still happening. You know, people still get sick, just that plain old cold, um, or it's just plain old allergies as it is every year. Um, so, you know, so to not kind of run away with something with the idea of like, oh my God, I have COVID. I mean, you might, but, but also maybe not. Um, so don't kind of jump to conclusions, which is a lot of what anxiety does. It kind of runs us down the road. Like we start making assumptions, we connect things, we, you know, and often our imagination is worse than reality is the problem with anxiety. So, you know, a little anxiety helps you think about and prepare for the future, and that's good. But beyond a point, it's no longer protective, and it's actually making you more miserable, which potentially also makes you more vulnerable to getting sick if stress is knocking down your immune system a bit. So getting enough sleep is helpful. Fact versus speculation. Yeah. What do I know for sure? What am I thinking? Yeah. That can help. And I've also noticed two people with ADHD and anxiety are telling me, well, finally, I'm prepared for what this is. Right. <laughs> that this actually works in my favor. So I've also had people tell me that they, uh, with social anxiety, they're actually like, oh, the pressure's off now, which is right. interesting. So I think feeling relief is pretty normal, too, which I think is not not everybody's feeling relief. But sometimes people are like, yeah, I've been I've been kind of prepared for this for like my whole life. <laughs> And it's definitely true. I mean, it's kind of a funny circumstance in a way, like in an unfunny situation. But um, but yeah, I mean, there are some people who like their anxiety feels vindicated, you know, like I've been washing my hands all the time. And now you bastards. Now, you know, I was right. (laughs) And I have all the Clorox wipes. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) You doubted me. Now who's laughing? Um, But, you know, it's one of those things that like, okay, if it helps you feel better in the moment, fine, whatever. But I think it's also, you know, one of the things with anxiety is to not take that once in a while vindication as proof that you were right all along in that all the rest of the stuff that you did was worth doing, you know, because the problem with anxiety is it's not delusional in the sense of like, probably most people with anxiety disorders are not worrying about like Martians abducting them, right? Which is an incredibly unlikely event. They're worrying about things that are sort of possible, maybe not as much as they worry, but like could happen. So some with social anxiety, sometimes they do say something stupid and someone is a jerk about it. Like that's not inconceivable, but it's pretty unlikely. So, you know, to say then that, you know, all this social distancing justifies my social anxiety, like, no, it doesn't. Like, it does right now. But beyond this, or, you know, if you have OCD and you wash your hands a lot, it doesn't mean that after COVID is over, that that you should continue to wash your hands 50 times a day. So, you know, part of the problem with anxiety is we take these little bits of proof as vindication to explain all the rest. And it's not necessarily true. Ah, so keep up with your treatment even after this yeah. is done. Yeah, yeah, and did not use this to justify more problematic behavior later. Ah, good point. So if there is one thing you want to leave people with during this time of you know, unexpected togetherness, what would it be? I think it's to make the most of the opportunity that's here. And again, not the opportunity we asked for, definitely not the circumstances that we would have, you know, wanted for people to spend a lot more time together at home, at least. Um, But here we are. So try to find the ways to enjoy it for what it is and to focus on the things you can do something about and to try to minimize the the 
extent to which the things you can't control are dominating how you feel. Well, thanks so much for being on Talking Brains again, my frequent guest. Yes, my pleasure. It's always fun for us to hang out. And I'm going to repeat your website to everybody. So it's adultadhdbook.com. And Mm -hmm. you're Ari Tuckman, PsyD, certified sex therapist and author of ADHD After Dark, Better Sex Life, Better Relationship. And I'm Dr. Stephanie Sarkis at stephaniesarkis.com. And thanks for joining us on the podcast.